we have read the first para, so I'll quickly go through it. I think it'll be easy, so no problem. We know the divine teacher. He is the avatar. We see the human disciple. It remains to form a clear conception of the doctrine. What is the Gita saying? What is uh, Shri Krishna telling Arjuna, who is refusing to fight, refusing to fulfill his swadharma? Okay. Which Jagata, is, can you help me with the page, please? Oh yes, it's a. We are beginning the fourth chapter, the core of the teaching. Okay. Very easy. Get it, and then we'll start. Yeah. Got it? Yeah. Okay. So. He is saying, <coughs> we know the divine teacher. He has, there is a whole chapter on the divine teacher and the human disciple. And remember, just remember that the human disciple he is not someone who is already doing yoga. He is someone who is ready to understand the yogic principles. But he is an ordinary man. Okay? He is a Kshatriya and he has got his own values. So the point of saying this again and again is, that the Gita is not something meant only for yogis. It is something meant for everyday life, how to lead your life. Okay? That's the important part because in the end of the, in the last, the message of the Gita, Sri Ramadu says that the Gita is telling everybody, the ordinary man, Gita says, go to dharma, start doing your dharma. Okay, very simple. Go to the temple. Okay, worship the divine. Understand the right. Be moral. Okay, then the one who is already moral, he the Gita says, go to a spiritual level. Okay, so and the one who is already at a spiritual level, he tells them to not reject the physical world and work in the physical world and loka sankrahan artha. That means to increase the and loka hite. You should be doing work for the mankind, okay? Then the one who is already at that level, <laughs> the last one that Sri Ramadu supplies, that we have to take the evolution forward, okay? So this is the, that's why the core of the teaching is so important. Let's see what he says. We know the divine teacher, we know the, we see the human disciple. It remains to form a clear conception of the doctrine. A clear conception, fastening upon the essential idea, the central heart of the teaching is especially necessary here because the Gita with its rich and many-sided thought, its synthetical grasp of different aspects of the spiritual life and the fluent winding motion of its argument lends itself even more than other scriptures to one-sided misrepresentations born of a partisan intellectuality because it recommends karma yoga, bhakti yoga, vijnana yoga. And there are many who say, oh, Gita is saying karma yoga, Gita is saying, no, no, bhakti yoga, partisan, whatever you want, you prefer, you are saying that Gita is saying that, but no. So they are saying it actually is mis misrepresented when you say that it is synthetical, it is recommending all the things. Why? Look at the, the fluent winding motion of its argument. <laughs> it covers all the aspects. Okay. The unconscious or half conscious resting of fact and word and idea to, <coughs> to suit a preconceived notion or the doctrine or principle of one's preference is recognized by Indian logicians as one of the most fruitful sources of fallacy. Okay. In other words, your vital has got a preference and your mind will support that. This is what happens 99% of the time with ordinary human beings. Okay. Even when you see something wrong, you will support your friend. Okay. So it is your attachment to not only to people but to ideas and you will import that attachment into your argument. So simply saying this is a very, very common flaw in logic, okay? The unconscious or half conscious, you may be unconscious or so maybe half conscious, because if you are fully conscious, you won't do it, <laughs> you will recognize. So unconscious or half conscious, resting, to rest means to extract with force and violence, to extract something with force and violence. This is rest, okay? To resting 
of what a fact and word and idea all these things you are pulling out and giving it a particular meaning which it does not have to suit a preconceived notion or the doctrine or principle of one's preference is recognized by indian logicians as one of the most fruitful sources of fallacy this is very very often those who are logically minded do make this mistake it's very common as we have been saying okay so and it is perhaps the one which it is most difficult for even the most conscientious thinker to avoid to <coughs> to let the not let the vital and your preferences enter into your argument be absolutely remain the mind should be completely free from the requirements of vital land body then you won't make a mistake for the human reason is incapable of always playing the detective upon itself in this respect it is its very nature to see upon some partial conclusion idea principle become its partisan and make it the key to all truth and it has an infinite faculty of doubling upon itself <laughs> okay doubling upon itself so as to avoid detecting in its operations this necessary and cherished weakness doubling upon yourself means it comes back to your own it doesn't go out and look for truth okay it it insists doubling upon itself you are insisting on your own idea you are coming back into yourself okay so as to avoid directing detecting its operations this is ne- this necessary and cherished weakness then the gita lends itself easily to this kind of error because it is easy by throwing particular emphasis on one of its aspects or even on some salient and emphatic text and putting all the rest of the 18 chapters into the background or making them a subordinate and auxiliary teaching to turn it into a partisan okay <coughs> partisan it's pronounced okay je partisan <laughs> of our own doctrine or dogma in other words he is saying that there are, and you will see later on that he says that even uh, bal gangadhar tilak insisted on the gita being <coughs> karma yoga but the bhakti yoga and the gnana yoga part was uh, less stressed with him in him but it is all are important that's what he is saying so it's clear now what he is saying this is a logical fallacy which is very often applied to the gita okay now we can read the next so now one he is going to tell you what are these misrepresentations in three paragraphs he is going to tell you misrepresentation 1 misrepresentation 2 and misrepresentation 3 okay we'll tell you one by one all the misrepresentations so let's read thus thus there are those who make the gita teach not works at all but a discipline of preparation for renouncing life and works the indifferent performance of prescribed actions or of whatever task may lie ready to the hands becomes the means the discipline the final renunciation of life and works is the sole real object it is quite easy to justify this view by citations from the book and by a certain arrangement of stress in following our our following out its argument especially if we shut our eyes to the peculiar way in which it uses such a word as sanyasa renunciation but it is quite impossible to persist in this view on an impartial reading in face of the continual assertion to the very end that action should be preferred to inaction and that superiority lies with the true the inner renunciation of desire by equality and the giving up of the works to the supreme purusha yeah. this is <coughs> most important uh, aspects of the gita there is says renunciation sanyasa and tyaga okay so these two words there is a play and people misunderstand that the real sanyasa is not the giving up of the world or giving up of action okay you have you should not give up action at all न कर्म लिप्यते न रे एज दिशोपनिषद सेज इट डज नॉट यू कैन डू इट नॉर्मली इट डज वेन यू डू एन एक्शन 
there is a reaction and you suffer but you can cut the attachment in the source when you cut the attachment in the source the work that you do is not so important most sometimes it is necessary in the sense to even give up the physical action okay you <laughs> if you are <clears throat> a doctor for instance or a politician you need not give it up normally you try and cut the attachment to things in your own self then the work you can continue to do but sometimes if you feel that my cutting the attachment in myself is not very successful then to test yourself as to how much you have really become without attachment give up the physical action itself then you will know the reaction in you will tell you if there is absolutely no reaction in you you have managed to cut the connection in the in yourself but if you see that there is still a hankering for the work that you have to do then you know that you have not yet given up the whole thing okay so, in fact that's what happened to shramdo na he was doing the work in the uh, revolutionary field but he was ordered by shri krishna to go elsewhere and sit quiet <coughs> and get away from this work and do another work i am giving you another work okay so this is the first misinterpretation sanyasa <clears throat> but they interpreted as giving up the physical world and giving up physical action <clears throat> you should not give up because in many other places he says very clearly action should be preferred to in action <clears throat> in fact that's the most karmanye va adhikara se ma phaleshu kadachana okay don't be attached to action or to in action neither to action nor to in action very very clear okay na karma hetu hetur uh, i forgot the exact words but na karma phala hetur bu na mate sango stu abhi karmani ha tu ha sango na akarmani you should not even have a attachment to sanga is attachment and to non action that also you should not have so this is the first misinterpretation second para and the second misinterpretation so giving up the physical world is often people say recommended by <laughs> the gita it is not we read the next one others again speak others again speak of the gita as if the doctrine of devotion were its whole teaching mm-hmm. and put in the ba- background its monistic elements and the high place it gives to quietistic emergence in one, in the one self of all and undoubtedly its emphasis on devotion its insistence on the aspect of the divine as lord and purusha and its doctrine of the purushottam the supreme being who is superior both to the mutable being and to the immutable and who is what in his relation to the world he know has god are the most striking and among the most vital elements of the gita still this lord is the self in whom all knowledge culminates and the master of the sacrifice to whom all works lead as well as the lord of love into whose being the heart of devotion enters and the gita preserves a perfectly equal balance emphasizing now knowledge now works now devotion but for the purposes of the immediate trend of the thought not with any absolute separate preference of one over the other he in whom all we meet and become one he is the supreme being the purushottama yeah so this is the other mistake that they make that oh gita is recommending bhakti most important aspect no not necessarily because the gita as he says now it is stressing knowledge now it is stressing works okay now it is stressing devotion so this is the misinterpretation when you are have got bhakti you worship the divine in in his physical in his, sorry his personal form okay but the other one the one in which you go to the self and you are uh, plunged in knowledge and the impersonal aspect of the divine that also there is an opposition because in one there is emotion in the other there is no emotion you only have knowledge okay the emotions don't come into the picture at all it can it's not that it can't 
it depends on the individual but normally the ascetic is interested only in the knowledge aspect jnana yoga so jnana yoga and karma yoga uh, sorry the bhakti yoga are often uh, pitted against each other as enemies they are really not they can be completely harmonious with each other if you worship the divine in a personal manner but not at the lower level at the highest level that's a purushottama we again go on stressing the three aspects na no? when you are in the physical world you are in ignorance that's level number 1 level number 2 the spiritual planes of consciousness where you get normally knowledge okay and when you go to the third level which is the super mind or the purushottama or in some those words he prefers the word ishvara okay and that is the where you combine the personal aspect and the impersonal aspect there all the contraries are completely harmonized okay so that's the second misinterpretation first misinterpretation give up the physical works okay second misinterpretation don't worry about knowledge and all that worry about the bhakta bhakti devotion is the most important now we come to the third <laughs> Yeah. Rangada, one yes. question: What is the mutable being B capital? Okay, mutable being is in the uh, our level, the first level, because everything in the physical world is moving, na. As we, I told you, remember some two, three principles which you have to uh, keep in mind very clearly. One, the highest is immutable, no movement at all. At the lower level in our physical world. everything is mutable there is no immutability in the physical world keep this very firmly in your mind okay even that table which doesn't seem to be moving is actually moving at the atomic level okay so there is nothing that is completely stable <laughs> so okay rakata can we say mutable being and immutable as kshara and akshara purusha yes absolutely that is words that the gita uses the kshara purusha is your when you are identified with your body mind life and that's a mutable when you are in the spiritual planes of consciousness you are in the akshara because you are not there is immutability but these two seem to be opposites so you have to combine them and you go to the purushottam level okay in fact words used in the gita are kshara purusha then kshara purusha is the mutable being that also is the divine because this psychic being is actually evolving so he is mutable even the divine here is mutable okay in the your psychic being is evolving you can't say that it is static it's a self that is static the self is the second level okay then they seem to be opposites so how do you combine them so akshara purusha ksh, sorry kshara purusha akshara purusha the second level third level uttama purusha the ultimate purusha so you reverse the words and make it purushottama okay so if you use the word purusha kshara purusha akshara purusha uttama purusha and that uttama purusha is in the lord like a king he is a person dealing with his own kingdom which is the universe that is creator okay palu clear mutable and yes, immutable sir. yeah okay so keep these basic ideas the highest is i repeat these base three four things that you must remember at the highest level immutability that highest level can include also the spiritual planes of consciousness okay there is immutability and there is total mutability at the lower level number 1 number 2 at the highest level only one at the lowest level multiplicity infinite forms at the highest level infinity at the lowest level finiteness is the main characteristic the universe may be infinite but everything in it is finite all the things in it are finite okay then absolute top light absolute bottom darkness absolute top formlessness there is no form that's why the gods can take any forms they want okay <laughs> when you worship a god he can appear to you in the form that you are imagining him to be okay and in the physical world rigid forms so keep these three four ideas firmly in your mind eh many many things will become clear okay total freedom on top total lack of freedom below lack of freedom means laws 
you are bound by laws when laws are there there is no freedom even in the physical world na no? when the government makes a law okay you are bound by certain things when the traffic light comes red you are not allowed to move that's a law okay so, so the physical world is all bound by laws otherwise there will be chaos so you think that there is you better govern everything by laws but all the laws are very very relative they are never absolutely true and that is why mukti when you go to the spiritual level of consciousness no laws apply to you and that is one of the main things that also the gita stresses sarva dharman parityajya okay so now we go to the third so first misinterpretation give up the physical world and action second misinterpretation most important thing is the devotion now the third one okay but at the present day since in fact the modern mind began to recognize and deal at all with the gita the tendency is to subordinate its elements of knowledge and devotion to take advantage of its continual insistence on action and to find in it a scripture of the karma yoga a light leading us on the path of action a gospel of works and doubted me the gita is a gospel of works but of works which culminate in knowledge that is in spiritual realization and quietude and of works motivated by devotion that is a conscious surrender of one whole self first into the hands and then into the being of the supreme and not at all of works as they are understood by the modern mind not at all an action dictated by egoistic and altruistic by personal social humanitarian motives principles ideals yet this is what present day interpretations seek to make of the gita we are told continually by many authoritative voices that the gita opposing in this the ordinary ascetic and the quietistic tendency of indian thought and spirituality proclaims with no uncertain sound the gospel of human action the ideal of this interested performance of social duty nay even it would seem the quite modern idea of social service to all this i can only reply that very patently and even on the very surface of it the gita does nothing of the kind and that this is a modern misreading a reading of the modern mind into an ancient book of the present day european or europeanized intellect into a thoroughly antique a thoroughly oriental and indian teaching that which the gita teaches is not a human but a divine action not the performance of social duties but the abandonment of all other standards of duty or conduct for a selfless performance of the divine will working through our nature that social service but the action of the best the god possessed the master man done impersonally for the sake of the world and as a sacrifice to him who stands behind man and nature yeah so this is the other one because action okay and in fact he is uh, uh, referring here i had asked jolda because he is saying uh, he is saying by uh, some well known people na he is saying uh, by okay we'll read the whole para but at the present day since in fact the modern mind began to recognize and deal at all with the gita the tendency is to subordinate its elements of knowledge and devotion and to take advantage of its continual insistence on action and to find in it a scripture of the karma yoga a light leading us on the path of action a gospel of works okay Undoubtedly, the Gita is a gospel of works. Definitely, it tells you to do work. But works how? Not dictated by the mind and the ego, but dictated by the divine. There is a huge difference because if you say mind and ego, you will interpret it as social duty. 
and that's a western idea in the west they have got the idea of the social duty in fact the christians also do that sure. they do conversion work but they will come and do social duty they'll give you education they'll open schools they'll open charity centers all these things they will do okay but that is all based on ego and not the divine action that's what sir is making a very clear distinction undoubtedly the gita is a gospel of works but of works which culminate in knowledge that is in spiritual realization and quietude okay and works motivated no not the word quietude because you are working in the physical world but inside you are absolutely calm and quiet there is no reaction at all yeah the most important quiet right and works motiv- motivated <laughs> normally you would say motivated motivated by devotion that is a conscious surrender of one's whole self first into the hands and then into the being of the divine that's interesting then in other words first into the hands means you become a puppet in his hands you obey him but then afterwards you become the divine then into the being of the divine a perfect uh, oneness with the divine so you you there is no difference in the first one you are an instrument in the second one you yourself become the divine okay not at all of works as they are understood by the modern mind the modern mind understands it by charity philanthropy social service okay where there is a, a flood go and help them where there is a plague go and help them this sort of thing that's fine it's it's not that it should not be done but it's not a spiritual action that's exactly the point no one is saying that you should not do social work if you are at a level where social work is important to you by all means do it because you are not at a spiritual level but that doesn't mean to say this is spiritual work this is a confusion that very often comes okay <laughs> very often you will see film stars claiming that i live a spiritual life in other words they are just concentrating a little and doing puja maybe one once a day and that becomes a spiritual life okay <laughs> so it's not that at all social work and philanthropy and altruism is not spiritual it is usually 90% of the time it is based on ego you get satisfaction out of it you get egoistic satisfaction out of it now it uh, interesting question arises can you do social work without an ego of course it is possible but it must be dictated by the divine if the divine tells you do social work then you will obey the divine but it should not be dictated by the ego and the mind that's the important part nobody is condemning social work but it is not spiritual action if it is based on the ego okay very clear so uh, is a conscious surrender of one's whole being first into the hands and then into the being of the supreme and not at all of works as they are understood by the modern mind not at all an action dictated by egoistic and altruistic even philanthropy okay by personal social humanitarian motives it's very good but it's not necessary at all okay so in fact in america also they had what once they called a peace corps okay they used to come and do all sorts of works in the in the other poorer countries so all this is fine there is no problem but it is not spiritual principles so humanitarian motives principles ideals yet this is what present day interpretation seek to make of the gita we are told continually by many authoritative voices that the gita opposing in this the ordinary ascetic and quietist tendency of indian thought and spirituality proclaims with no uncertain sound the gospel of human action continue to do human action the ideal of disinterested performance of social duties okay do social duties nay even it would seem the quite modern ideal of social service to all this i can only reply by the way uh, by many authoritative voices in the gita so i had asked jugalda who is this authoritative voice who says that the gita is only karma yoga so he told me it is a uh, <coughs> i am not verified because i am not read but he said it is bal ganga dar tilak okay so tilak was a great man no doubt but his interpretation of the gita may have been little faulty okay 
<laughs> okay, so he was a very fine, he was a collaborator with Sri Aurobindo in the revolutionary movement. <laughs> Sri Aurobindo gave him very high praise. But yet, his idea of the Gita may have been wrong. I am not 100% sure, that's what Jogalda told me. By many authority devices, Bal Ganga the Tilak. Okay, so, <laughs> opposing in this, the, I remember also once a, a young girl came from America, okay, and she was very Christian and she was very, uh, she was interested in spiritual life. And she had a talk with me and I told her that the mm -hmm. social service is not spiritual. She disagreed. She said, no, 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 I have to do social work. It is selflessness and I have to do social work. <laughs> so, fine, if you are inclined to do that, do that by all means. Not necessarily a spiritual action. <coughs> so, to all this, I can only reply. Now, this is very unusual for Sri Aurobindo. Normally, he does not say, I can only reply. But here is very, very categorical. My idea is different. To all this, I can only reply that very patently, and even on the very surface of it, the Gita does nothing of the kind. This is something, a language which Sri Aurobindo uses is very unusual. <laughs> he is never so categorical. Okay? He is very, he is always suggestive in his ideas. But here is very, very categorical. Not only is saying I, but he is also saying Gita does nothing of the kind. And that this is a modern misreading, a reading of the modern mind into an ancient book of the present day European or Europeanized intellect. Because that's what the Christians do. They believe in social service. Okay. They should do that. <clears throat> Go into the, uh, of course, the main intention of the Europeans were spread Christianity. But how do you spread that? With a little bit of good. Open schools, do charity work, okay, all these type of things. So, present day European or Europeanized intellect into a thoroughly antique, antique, very, very old, thoroughly oriental and Indian teaching. That which the Gita teaches is not a human, but a divine action. All social work, humanitarian work, philanthropy, helping others is fine. But if it comes from the ego and you get a satisfaction of it, then it is not spiritual. Now, this is very interesting because <coughs> I'll give you some examples and you'll see it's a very interesting thing. <coughs> there was a gentleman who came to the ashram and said, Mother, uh, your school appears it needs a boarding, so I will give a lack of rupees for uh, starting a boarding, but maybe my name can come on the name plate on the outside the door. Okay, so this is very clearly charity, but with an egoistic attitude. Okay, so now there is somebody also, for instance, uh, Amitabh Bachchan. Nah? He does a lot of social work quietly without telling anybody. Okay, that means apparently. He is not taking any credit for it. There are people who say, I have fed today 100,000 people and let it be published in the newspapers. You are taking credit for it. But when this uh, somebody does a work and says, I don't want any publicity, does it become a spiritual thing? No. <laughs> ah, there is inner satisfaction. <laughs> you, are yes. you, guys, you are praising yourself silently. Okay, So it's a very subtle thing. <laughs> So, this is, so you can imagine how difficult it is to be absolutely selfless. Okay. So, the Gita does nothing of the kind and into an ancient and, uh, and that this is a modern misreading, a reading of the European mind into an ancient book or the present day European or Europeanized intellect into a thoroughly anti, thoroughly oriental Indian teaching. That means the Gita teaches is not human, not based on ego but a divine action. You are only obeying the divine and the divine can tell you to do these things which you may not even approve of morally, but then you have to do it. Just like Sri Krishna is telling uh, Arjuna, you can even uh, kill your own grandfather and your own um, relatives. So you have to do it. It's a divine action. Not the performance of social duties, but the abandonment of all other standards of duty we remind you of the Sarva Dharman Paritecha. Okay? Abandonment of all standards of duty and conduct 
for a selfless performance of the divine will. What the divine is telling you to do, you do. But is that possible at our level? No. But we can keep try, trying. We go on trying, 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 and one day you will make out the difference between your own will and the divine will. In the beginning, you can't. Obviously not. Working through our nature, not social work, but the action of the best, the God possessed, the master men, done impersonally for the sake of the world. Okay. Now, for the sake of the world is a phrase used in the Gita. Okay. Sarva hita hita rathe, sarva hita. Sarva hita rate, this is the you have to be for the good of the world. And loka sangrahan artham, these are the two phrases that the Gita uses. Sarva hita rata, rata, that means you are engaged in the good of all for the sake of the world and as a sacrifice to him who stands behind man and nature. Okay. So, man and nature, so you are stationed in the highest. So these are the three misinterpretations of the Gita. And Sri Ramadhi is saying, you have to be careful that the Gita does nothing of the sort. Actually, it is encouraging all the aspects. Bhakti Yoga, Karma Yoga, Jnana Yoga. We have techniques. I think, I think, yeah. I think people uh, think that it is uh, insisting on karma because th this whole uh, teaching came at the time of uh, when Arjuna says that, no, I will not fight. That's right. He, he, is, he is saying that I will not act. That's that right. That is why it is taken as uh, uh, mainly Karma Yoga, no? That's right. That's right. <laughs> but you are asking him to go to the Purushottama level. <laughs> okay. And then do. Don't let your own ego decide what is right and wrong. Then you are on a moralistic basis. But you have to be on a spiritualistic basis, not the mind and the ego. But the divine will tell you what to do and what not to do. Is it possible at our level? Certainly not. But we can understand very clearly, if you are honest with ourselves, that it is my ego, my desire, my vital that is asking me to do something. But even that, you recognize it and go on and try to change it. <laughs> try to reduce the egoistic influence in yourself. Then slowly, slowly, it will come. Okay? We can read one more small para. Not very small, but we can read the next one. In other words, so who can read now? Jasmine yes, read. Um, Achanti. Yeah, you'll read. I think Achanadi is not there. Okay, then Gita maybe or even Jyoti Anand. Jyoti Anand often doesn't read, so it would be nice if you could read Jyoti. <laughs> Since the images are not there, I don't know if you are on the line. So if Jyoti also she is on the line but muted. Ah, I know, but she may not be present at the near the computer or whatever phone. So Gita can. Shilpa can read. Shilpa also can read. Yeah. Decide quickly and start. Okay, I will read then. <laughs> okay, go ahead. In other words, yeah. in other words, the Gita is not a book of practical ethics, but of the spiritual life. The modern mind is just now the European mind, such as it has become after having abundant not only the philosophic idealism of the highest Greco-Roman culture from which it started, but the Christian devotionalism of the Middle Ages. These it has replaced by or transmuted into a practical idealism and social, patriotic and philanthropic devotion. It has got rid of God or kept him only for Sunday use and erected in his place man as its deity and society as its visible idol. At its best, it is practical, ethical, social, pragmatic, altruistic, humanitarian. Now, all these things are good, are especially needed at the present day, are part of the divine will, or they would not have become so dominant in humanity. <clears throat> Nor is there any reason why the divine man, the man who lives in the Brahmic consciousness, 
in the god being should not be all of these things in his action he will be if we are at if we are the best ideal of the age the yuga dharma and there is no yet higher ideal to be established no great radical change to be effected for he is as the teacher points out to to his disciple the best who has to set the standard for others and in fact arjuna is called upon to live according to the highest ideals of his age and the prevailing culture but with knowledge with understanding of that which lay behind and not as ordinary men with a following of the merely outward law and rule very clearly he is giving you the difference between a spiritual life and a moral life moral life is fine he is saying there is no problem with that but it is not spiritual and the gita is not telling you to act through the moral mental ideal act through the spiritual ideal be a servant of the god and listen to what he is saying okay so that's what he is saying we can look at some of the words it's it interesting but same is very very clear so in other words the gita is not a book of practical ethics note the word ethics morality and morality is always made by the mind okay it's a mind that sets standards of conduct the mind okay you can't do this you can't do that even all the <clears throat> the 10 commandments they are all moral okay morality very useful for the animal man you have to have morality you can't steal you can't tell lies you can't do this you can't do that you can't hurt others all these things are very very obvious so the one who has no standard at all he has to be given morality so that's the first standard but morality is not the ultimate standard in uh, synthesis of yoga he has a chapter called the standards of conduct and the standards of conduct there are four so the says i'm just repeating that because it's relevant here the first standard is when you have to develop yourself you are justified fully in doing egoistic works because if you don't do egoistic works and you don't have a motive in your action you will not be able to develop yourself to develop yourself fully your individuality is absolutely valid okay so you develop yourself fully and the ego is a helper and the desire also is a huge helper without desire you will not be able to develop yourself that's the first standard the second standard when you are developing yourself when you are you doing egoistic works okay your ego may come in clash with somebody else you will necessarily step on other people's toes so there will be a clash so morality steps in okay morality uh, so, social social laws step in you can't do this you can't do that and the third level is the social laws that's the second standard of conduct the society tells the individual what he can do and what he cannot do okay it's a society that imposes laws on the individual the third standard of conduct is the individual is telling society what he should do and what should not do that means the morality is coming from inside man okay the second standard is society is telling you what to do and not to do maybe a good example is the <laughs> traffic lights okay very easy you can't do this you can't do that you have to be you can't uh, <clears throat> you have to subscribe to certain things which you you can't play music at midnight okay that's not a morality it's a social standard <laughs> so that's the second standard the third standard is moral it's a the second standard society is telling the individual what he should do the third standard is individual is telling society that these are the these are the standards which we have to follow okay and the last is the spiritual all these standards you have to give up and follow only the divine commandment that's basically what is the four standards of conduct so here he is telling you that okay the <clears throat> in other words gita is not a book of practical ethics it is not morality but a spiritual life the modern mind is just now the european mind because it has conquered the world everywhere and everybody follows the european standards unfortunately even today in india also in such a fantastic civilizational background there are many many indians who are still subject to 
western ideas unfortunately okay there is a movement against that now but there is a lot of resistance also hmm. in india ramada okay. I, i have a question when uh, this individual telling the society would it be things like liberty equality fraternity yes also yes or all these uh, all these path breaking ideas like marx at some point or french revolution that is more social ideas na no that but it comes from an individual it comes from an individual right but it becomes yeah but uh, morality what, what would be the example of individual telling the society the 10 commandments <laughs> <laughs> you can't steal you can of of course there is a there is a overlapping of the social standards and the individual standard there is an overlapping but still there is a difference <clears throat> okay social standards as i told you okay you can't okay. Play, you can't play music at midnight to disturb your labor or you know, the traffic lights will tell you what you should do and what there's nothing moral about it it's only a social standard okay you can do this you can't do that okay <laughs> you have to pay your taxes okay so that's again a social law <laughs> nothing moral about it but the morality is the individual who feels the truth within himself that truth may be imperfect but he is the one who tells you can't do the ten commandments is the best example of morality <laughs> okay <laughs> okay so i think we have to stop here 835 so it's very clear what he is saying the gita is not recommending moral action it is recommending spiritual action what's the difference moral action is you yourself are deciding what is good and what is bad spiritual action you are deciding nothing at all you are making yourself absolutely calm and quiet and obeying the divine command possible not so easy very difficult <laughs> but that has to be done Okay, we stop here today. Okay, so next time, yeah. Merci beaucoup. Au revoir, Sangha. Au revoir, tout le monde. Au revoir. Yeah, au revoir. Sangha, we will redo this para next next week. Yeah, yeah, we can do that. We can. Au revoir, bonne journée. Au revoir, everybody. Page twenty-eight.